going to start. Let's get um, going. So if you all want to stand up, we'll get ready to worship the Lord. Father, we praise you today, Lord, for this day, for this time together, Lord, as always. Thank you for getting us here and bless our time, bless our worship. And may you be glorified in all we say and all that we do today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
You can be seated.
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up your eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart and Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my
Jesus is calling you? Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling you. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and train them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was brought with the precious blood of jesus christ is calling oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was brought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ
bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Oh, Jesus, what a treasure we have in you, our Savior, our Lord. Give us boldness and courage in this day and age to proclaim that to everyone we, everyone we meet. Fill us with your spirit this morning. Fall afresh. And give us soft hearts to receive your word with gladness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you again, Lord, that we're just, again, here together in your house. Lord, I just lift up those who aren't here this morning, Lord, for various reasons, Father. And God, I just thank you for everybody that's here this morning. Lord, I just pray that our hearts are open to hear your message, Lord, and that um, our, our lives are changed in, in a way today. Father, and again, I just thank you so much for your blessings, Lord, and I just pray as we give our tithes and offerings, Lord, you just receive them and multiply them. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a couple things this, this morning. So um, next Sunday is our potluck. So it's a soup, bread, and sandwich theme. And so I've got the sign-up sheet. I'll make sure it gets out to everybody today. So again, it's just always a great time of fellowship and that. So again, that'll be for next Sunday. And uh, also, too, um, we got Harvest Carnival. There's a big black tub there in the back now. So start watching for those uh, candy sales because we need a, a lot. And uh, it's kind of awesome because, again, like I mentioned last time that we've had this. Last year, we had just over 150 people come through the church. So it's great. So this year, I'm hoping it'll be at least 200 again, if not more. And it's neat because we had last year, there's a, one family that comes every year. At least I think they've been here every year. But last year, they even made it. They come from somewhere like in Beaverton or something just to go <laughs> come all the way just for our Harvest Carnival because they like it that much. And probably because the you know, kids get about 10 pounds of candy each, I think. So <laughs> it's pretty crazy. So, again, that's coming up. So there are some flyers in the back, so feel free to pick up some of these little cards. It just gives a little bit more, more on the times than that. There's also a sign-up sheet in the back, and I'll remind you every week in, you know, coming up to that. But uh, if you want to help out and you can't help out, like, you know, taking care of one of the games or something that evening, just, you know, write it down. If you already know what game you want to do, you can mention that too. Otherwise, we'll make sure that, you know, you get plugged in with the games that you want. But we'll do everything upstairs and downstairs again like we do every year and place for pictures and stuff downstairs. So it's a lot of fun, pretty neat experience. Um, also too, Larry uh, asked me each year, you know, around the month of December, we do Advent. And he's going to miss several uh, Sundays that week. So we're still going to do Advent, but he would like somebody who would like to learn a little bit and kind of do what he does where he comes up, gives a little bit of the history of Advent, talks about it. Then somebody comes up here, we pray and light the candles. But we would like somebody, if you would like to be the one to say, yes, I'd love to be the one to share about Advent and stuff each Sunday leading up to that to Christmas and all. So if that's something you would like to do, let me know and I can let Larry know and then he can meet with you and just kind of walk you through everything, give you the information in that. So um, Harvest Carnival. Also too, again, we've got so many things to pray about. You know, I know... Um, you probably saw on the uh, prayer request this week, just uh, Sarah Beth, her nephew, um, and his wife, they lost their little three-year-old son to, to cancer this week. So, again, pretty horrific stuff. And my niece, I've been kind of sharing with how she's doing with her brain tumor, but she's 43. And uh, the hospice said that she's probably got about 48 hours. So my sister said yesterday that she said she's seen my mom passed away from cancer about 25, about 30 years ago now. 25, 30 years ago, and uh, she said she remembers this, you know, those last couple days just kind of seeing those end-of-life things happening. That's what she sees happening with her daughter now, so it's pretty heartbreaking for her. But again, she knows that, you know, she's going to be going home with the Lord soon, and my niece told her mom the other day that she said, I don't want anybody praying for healing for me anymore. Just pray that God's going to just take me home soon, and just said it's all over with, so just hard stuff. 
And Bill Harness, again, you know, he's in uh, the, uh, here in Camas now, so if you can go by and see him and say hello, I know he'd appreciate the visit. And it's Prestige uh, Rehabilitation Center here in Camas where he's at. So, again, no, he'd love the, love the company if somebody wants to come by and say hello. And, again, he's, he's recovering. It's a long, long road, but... Uh, it's funny, Mike, Mike shared with me uh, last Sunday when they went to see him in the hospital. Somebody, you know, Bill's laying there embracing, can't even move, and they, somebody made an announcement that somebody had their motorcycle parked where it wasn't supposed to be. Somebody needed to move his motorcycle, and Bill rolled up and said, oh, I guess I got to get up and move my bike. <laughs> you know, so, so, yeah, it's real funny, Bill. So, anyway, he still has a sense of humor. So, anyways, other than that, um, if everybody wants to stand up and say hello to somebody, and then our children are dismissed. Let's, uh, let's, let's start off with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for your word today, Lord, as we get ready to just dig in and, and see what you have for us, Lord. So, so just um, soften us, Lord, open our hearts to you that we could hear you, hear what you have to say in this wonderful book, in Jesus' name, amen. So continuing on the Romans road, and we're now in chapter five, moving right along. Last message, our, uh, last time our message was how much is... How much faith is enough? Enough is a mustard seed, enough to be confident, and enough to be imputed. We talked about that last time. Today's message is faith benefits package. Paul has been showing us that the whole world is guilty before God. We are guilty as charged, and that no one can be saved by works or performance. And he's explained that God's way of salvation has always been by grace through faith. And he's used Abraham as an illustration, an example. Abraham believed God, and it was credit to him as righteousness. And the just shall live by faith. But it doesn't stop there. We've been justified by faith, and there are benefits to that faith. And so let's take a look at chapter 5, the first five verses. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so the faith benefits package. The first benefit of faith, number one in your outlines, is peace with God. Peace with God. Therefore... Having been justify, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been justified by faith. Literally, having been justified out of faith. The word by is the Greek preposition ek, which means out of. And ek is the word used in ecclesia, which is the word used for church in the Bible. And ecclesia means called out ones. We are called out, called out of this world. And so having been justified out of faith, and because of our faith, our believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we have been declared justified, declared righteous. It's a positional thing. You can't change it. It's position, and God has done it. And those who have placed their trust in Christ can rest assured that their faith has been credited to them as righteousness. Not just any righteousness, but the same righteousness that Jesus has, has now been credited to your account if you're a believer. Justification means just as if we didn't. Just as if we didn't sin. That's justification. And because of this, we have peace with God. Now, remember, before our justification, we were under the wrath of God. Paul pointed that out earlier in Romans. We were in conflict with God. We were enemies 
with God. But now, as believers, when we come to know him, we're at rest. We're at peace. We have shalom in our lives. And there are different kinds of peace that the world talks about. There is the quest for world peace. Gee, how are we doing with that one so far? Not too well, right? From world wars to terrorism to inner strife and riots and, and everything, you name it. In the 1960s, John Lennon wanted us to give peace a chance. Uh, in the 1970s, Cat Stevens said, all we need to do is get on the peace train. The Eagles sang, I wish for peace. And Bob Dylan, back in the 60s, said, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. Ironically, the world doesn't have peace, and peace eludes them, not because we're not on the peace train, or because we're not giving peace a chance, but because we reject the source of true peace, the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. That's why the world can't find peace. So Paul says we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And this is the only way that peace is possible. And that's because on the cross he met the conditions required for peace with God. And peace with God is what the gospel produces in the life of the person who receives the gospel, gospel message. But as I said, before we come to Christ, before we are justified, we are at enmity with God, the Bible says. We are enemies of God. We exist under the wrath of God. Isaiah 48, 22 says, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. The word wicked there can be translated guilty. There is no peace for the guilty. And we know from Paul that without Christ, we are all guilty as charged. All fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus came to establish peace between us and God, whether whether or not we feel like it is irrelevant. He came to establish it, and we can claim this peace with God through Christ Jesus. Wiersbe writes this. Condemnation means that God declares us sinners, which is a declaration of war. Justification means that God declares us righteous, which is a declaration of peace made possible by Christ's death on the cross. Remember what the heavenly host said when, when Jesus was born. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, what? Peace, goodwill toward men. This is not talking about world peace. This is talking about peace with God, which would now be available through Jesus Christ. And so peace with God means we have moved from being God's enemy to God's ally, to God's friend. There's no more hostility between us and God. Uh, there's no sin blocking our relationship with him. There's no past sin, no current sin, and no future sin blocking the way. And even more than that, a new relationship has been established, so we're no longer under the wrath of God, but now we live under the protection of God. So in reality, there's only two classifications of people on earth. Those who are enemies of God and those who have peace with God. That's it. All people fall into those two, cate two categories. And the only way to have peace with God is through and in and by Jesus Christ. Now, there's one more type of peace that the Bible talks about, and that is an inner peace of the soul, which the Bible refers to as the peace of God. So we have peace with God, and through that we have the peace of God. We get this peace by resting in Christ, surrendering to him on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And so we have peace with God first, and then comes the peace of God, which is an experiential peace, 
We experience it in our daily lives. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Boy, we need that in the day we're living in. And Colossians 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Wow. Be thankful. We can be so thankful because not only do we have peace with God, but we can also experience the peace of God in our daily lives as well. That passes all understanding. People don't understand it. The world does not understand the peace of God that Christians experience in the midst of chaos. It goes beyond understanding, but Christians can have it. And it rules in our hearts, and it guards our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. Peace with God, that's the first benefit. Number two, access to God. Access to God, verse two. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So the word access there was used to speak of uh, the entrance uh, into the presence of a king through the favor of another. In other words, I know the king, I can get you in to see him. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, in other words, we have an audience with the king. We, we have access to the king. And we can have intimacy with the king. And this access with and to God is because we now have peace with God. can't have access with God until you have peace with God first. So it's intimacy with God. Now, back in the Greek and Roman world, intimacy with God was unthinkable. That was an unthinkable thing. They, they didn't want to be intimate with their gods. They were afraid of them. And even the Jews... I mean, if there's one word that would describe the Jews and God's relationship, it would be separation. Separation. Uh, if you look at the temple court, for example, even in the temple area, it was all about separation. There was a place for the Gentiles, but they couldn't go beyond that. There was a place for the women, but they couldn't go beyond that. There was a place for the men of Israel, but they couldn't go beyond that. And even inside the temple itself, there was a place for the priests to take care of the holy place, but they couldn't go beyond that. Only the high priest could go into the holy of holies, and him only once a year on the day of atonement to make atonement for the sins of the nation. And the day of atonement is called Yom Kippur by the Jews. By the way, that starts today at sunset. Yom Kippur, today at sunset. And the Holy of Holies was separated from the holy place with a huge curtain in the temple. It was uh, about 60 feet high and inches thick. Huge curtain. And not only was this veil designed to block access to God's holiness, it also separated God from human sinfulness. And so the veil in the temple was a constant reminder to the Jews that sin rendered humanity unfit for the presence of God. That veil kept people out of the presence of God. There was separation. And so there was all of this separation from God, these boundaries, these hindrances, and the spiritual lesson in that, it all points to Jesus, folks. The spiritual lesson in that is apart from Jesus, there is separation from God. There is enmity with God. There is sin involved. But remember, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for our sins. And the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, the Bible says, was torn from top to bottom. God was eliminating that separation between man and God, and he was now providing access to himself. Not just access, 
but bold access. The writer to the Hebrews talks about this. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest. He's talking about the holy of holies there, going right into the presence of God. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he, he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, so now he's saying that the veil of the temple represents Jesus himself, his body being torn, you see, so we can enter into the presence of God through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So Jesus provides that way through the veil that only the high priest could go through. But now Jesus, as our high priest, paid the price for those sins. The veil was torn from top to bottom, and we now have access to God. Whew! Man, that is just awesome stuff, folks. So because we have peace with God, we now have complete access to God, and so... Again, the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And that word boldly means, can be translated confidence. We can come into the throne of grace with confidence. It can also be translated outspokenness. We can come into God's presence outspoken, speaking right out boldly and confidently as a son or a daughter of a parent is, is outspoken with their parents, right? Kids don't normally, I mean, in a normal family, they, they're not afraid to go to their parents. They're outspoken with their parents. And so we are the family of God when we're believers. Ephesians 2, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. And it goes on and says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. He abolished in his flesh that, that war with God, that enemy being enemies of God. So look at our verse again. It says, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Paul mentions the word grace six times in this chapter. I mean, he's really driving it home. And it's the Greek word charis, and we get the, our English word charisma from that word, and it means a manifestation of kindness a manifestation of undeserved, unmerited favor. That's charis. And the word stand means to stand firmly. We stand firm in this unmerited, undeserved favor and kindness. We can stand firm there. We don't stand in works or we're in trouble. We don't stand in our performance or kiss a goodbye. We stand in grace, folks. We don't stand in our behavior. We stand in grace. And we continue to stand. We stand in grace. We don't stand in our sins. We stand in grace. How can that be, you might say? I haven't even lived up to God's standard today. Of course you haven't. That's the whole point. That is Paul's point in these first five chapters of Romans. We can't do it. We can't accomplish it. So how can it be? Out of faith into this grace in which we stand. That's how. This is all God's doing. It's not ours. God did it. God sent his son. 
Jesus died on the cross. He did it all. It is finished. It was all him. We had nothing to do with it. So not only do we have peace with God and access to God, but we have hope in the glory of God. Same verse again in the end. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Earlier in Romans, Paul told us that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Remember that? But now, out of faith, being justified, we have peace with God, access to God, and we, we, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And the word hope in the Bible doesn't mean how, how we use it today, like, I hope it happens. That's not the word hope in the Bible. The word hope in the Bible is a confident expectation of it happening. In other words, we're confident. It's going to happen. And uh, so our hope is confidence and certainty, and our certainty goes right on into heaven. We will see the true glory of God through Jesus Christ. When we're in heaven, you will see, I will see, we will see the true glory of God through Jesus Christ. And we not only will receive the glory of God in heaven, but we can reflect it right now as believers. Moses said to God, show me your glory. Now, I don't know why he would have to say that. He had already seen the 10 plagues of Egypt. He had seen God part the Red Sea. He had seen all of these miracles and what have you, but yet he wanted more. And he said, show me your glory. And God said, you can't see my glory and live, but I'll show you my back. And God passed by and he showed his glory from behind and Moses started glowing because of that. Literally. His face started reflecting the glory of God and the brightness of his glory and presence. Now, it faded over time as he went back out there in the world. But then when he would go back into the meeting place, into the presence of God, that reflection would be restored and he would start glowing again. One commentator writes this, every human being was created to be a walking billboard, a living display of the glory of God. Like a neon sign bereft of glowing gas, the human frame apart from God stands lifeless and unanimated, displaying nothing except the clothes for business look of an abandoned storefront. Pieces of evidence can be found to indicate a former glory, but not enough to see it today. Therefore, Paul says, having been justified, resulting in peace with God, the hope that we have in manifesting the glory of God brings us joy. So since we have peace with God and access to God, we hope in the glory of God, both now and in eternity as well. And our relationship with God reflects God's glory as the moon reflects the glory of the sun. Are you following that? So the moon reflects the light of the sun. And it shines and it reflects that glory, if you will. So we're to reflect that glory, reflect the glory of the sun, S-O-N. But be careful, because the earth can come in between the moon and the sun, and we have a lunar eclipse, right? And what happens to the moon? It goes dark. And that's what happens in our lives when we allow the world to come in between us and the Lord. We go dark. The, the, the brightness diminishes. The brightness fades away. But God wants us to, to live in that fullness of brightness, that fullness of glory reflecting his glory to this dark world. 
So not only do we have peace with God and access to God and hope in the glory of God, but number four, we glory in stresses. Oh, I wish that wasn't there. We glory in stresses. And not only that, and not only that, and not only that, and another thing, right? Like those commercials that go, but wait, there's more. <laughs> and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. So our justification means that we can glory in tribulations. In other words, we don't have to dread it. It's not that we want tribulation or trouble in our lives or suffering in our lives, but we don't have to dread it. Paul isn't saying that when you become a Christian, you, you're not going to experience tribulations anymore. On the contrary, you may experience more because of your Christianity. We know it's going to happen. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, tribulation. Exactly. And the Greek word Paul uses for tribulation here, th uh, thlipsis, thlipsis, means literally to press or to squash or to crush. And it's a word that was used to describe the stresses of life. So Paul is saying that our trials, our stresses that we go through, they have purpose. The stresses we go through have a reason. And there's a reason that God allows them in order to benefit us for his glory. Now, the English word tribulation comes from the Latin tribulare, which also means to press, and it was used to thresh out grain from tribulum, which is a threshing sledge, or a threshing sled, if you will. And so the threshing, threshing sledge, or tribulum, was a, a, wood, wood, a wooden framework with bits of flint or metal fixed to the underside, and was hauled over the grain to crush it and break it apart, so that they could take the, the whole thing and throw it up into the wind, and the chaff would be blown away from the grain. And so this was the first step in that crushing, and it's where we get our English word tribulation from. And it, but it still means pressing, crushing. And that's what tribulations do in the life of the believer. It separates the true grain from the chaff so that it can be winnowed and the chaff can be blown away, and all that's left is the good stuff. John Peterson put it like this. He said, if you squeeze a lemon, you get lemon juice. If you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. If you squeeze a Christian, you should get Christ. Looking at the verse again, tribulation produces perseverance. So these tribulations, these troubles that we go through, these sufferings, they produce perseverance or endurance or some translations say patience some people say don't pray for patience because God will bring tribulations into your life well if that's what it takes for our growth then we need to pray for patience an athlete has to be put under stress to get better a bodybuilder has to put his muscles under stress to build his muscles. Now, when we go through tribulation, it really is all about our attitude. I mean, we can get bitter or we can allow God to use it to make us better. Some people get extremely bitter and resentful because of the trouble they go through. You've seen it. I've seen it. We've all seen it. And they, instead of turning toward God, they turn away from God. They're angry at God. And you're doing this to me kind of a thing. Martin Luther wrote this. Whatever virtues tribulation finds us in, it develops more fully. 
if anyone is carnal, weak, blind, wicked, irritable, haughty, and so forth, tribulation will make him more carnal, weak, blind, wicked, and irritable. On the other hand, if one is spiritual, strong, wise, pious, gentle, and humble, he will become more spiritual, powerful, wise, pious, gentle, and humble. It's all about our attitude. And if we're true believers of Christ, when those troubles come, we know God is going to work it all out for good. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul says, For our light affliction, and there's that same exact Greek word again, tribulation. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There's a word play there. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What's more important? The spiritual. And notice he calls them our light afflictions. He calls our tribulations our light afflictions, which is working an eternal weight of glory. Light afflictions but the weight of glory. And that's a positive thing. The word glory in the Old Testament actually meant weight or heavy. So the glory of God was the heaviness of God. Not in a bad sense, but in a good sense. The vastness of the glory of God. It's heavy, you see. So Paul is using a word play on that. Uh, Romans uh, 8.18 for I consider that the suffering, same Greek word, of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of the weight which shall be revealed in us. Wow. So Paul is saying, make sure you keep the proper perspective on things. These afflictions that we experience now, they're light compared to the future glory that we're going to experience. Looking at our verses again, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Not just character, but the word means proven character. It has the sense of a character that's been tested and found approved. It comes from a root word, which means to watch. And so our character is tested and approved through the tribulations that we go through as we cling to our Lord and Savior. Character in the believer is a consistent manifestation of Jesus in our lives. And character, hope. You, you can't have more perseverance, character, and hope with first, without first having tribulation. There are no shortcuts to it. And by the way, this is a complete rebuttal to the name it and claim it people. A complete rebuttal. The positive confessors who say you shouldn't have to suffer if you just have enough faith. It's not true. Paul says we glory in tribulations. Charles Spurgeon wrote this. Tribulation worketh patience, says the apostle. Naturally, it is not so. Tribulation worketh impatience. And impatience misses the fruit of experience and sours into hopelessness. Ask many who have buried a dear child or have lost their wealth or have suffered pain of body, and they will tell you that the natural result of affliction is to produce irritation against providence, rebellion against God, questioning, unbelief, petulance, and all sorts of evils. But what a wonderful alteration takes place when the heart is renewed by the Holy Spirit. Amen, Amen is right. Verse 5. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit 
who was given to us. That's really another benefit. The love of God being poured out in our hearts. How? By the Holy Spirit, who every Christian has living in them. Everyone is, who's a Christian has the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is... Hello? The fruit of the Spirit is... Love, love right. Exactly. So why do Christians have trials? Why do we suffer? A bunch of reasons. To glorify God, uh, discipline for known sin, to prevent us from falling into sin, to keep us from pride. Remember, Paul was kept, in pride, uh, kept from pride by the thorn in his flesh. To build faith, uh, to cause growth, to teach obedience and discipline, to equip us to comfort others, to prove the re reality of Christ in us, and for a testimony to the angels. Because the Bible says even the angels desire to look into these things. Interesting. So the faith benefits package. We have peace with God, access to God, hope in the glory of God, glory in stresses, because tribulations produce perseverance, perseverance character, character hope, and the Holy Spirit produces love in our hearts. That's a full benefits package. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today, Lord in this book of Romans and for these great and wonderful truths that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and that it doesn't depend on our behavior, our performance, what we do, the works that we do. It doesn't depend on all of the, any of that. It depends only on on Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for that wonderful hope that we have. Not hope in, as if we hope it happens, but hope because we expectantly wait for it to happen. Thank you, Lord, for these truths, for your grace, for your mercy, for Jesus who did it all, who gave himself up for us, Lord, on the cross. And again, Lord, if there's anybody here or anybody listening online or watching on YouTube who doesn't know you, Lord, oh, God, I pray that now would be the day, that this would be the day the Lord has made, and that they would surrender and put their total trust in you simply by praying, Father, I confess that I'm a sinner. I agree with you that I'm a sinner and that I need you in my life. Take over, Lord. I put my trust in you. Be the Lord of my life, the Savior of my soul. I give it all to you right now. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And for the rest of us, Lord, that we would stand firmly in that grace. Thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my 
Sun forbear to shine. 